Welcome, welcome back to another John R. with JB. Um, it's great to be back. As promised, this is part two of my um, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli watercolor and gouache uh, time lapse that I said I was going to put out. So basically, if you watch my video on AI art, um, I did part one sort of you know, I had part one kind of running in the background as I was, you know, going over my thoughts on that most important topic. And you may have seen me noodling away at Aragorn um, last week. Um, this week I'm sort of continuing that thought process, finishing up Aragorn here. And um, what I'm using, I'm using a modified version of the Riley palette, which is great for flesh tones. That's how I'm able to get those pop in the faces. And uh, I'm going through and just touching up some bits on the figure in the foreground here. Whenever I do a figurative work with uh, figures, figures in space in a made-up background or made-up scene, I try to hit the faces first, then hit the background and work from the back of the image to the front of the image. Um, I find that works best just because my creative juices are flowing uh, most potently <laughs> in the beginning uh, phases of my painting process. And um, when I have all that extra energy stored up, that's when I go in and hit the faces because they require a lot of mental energy on my part. Um, really, faces definitely exhaust me and it's something that I've constantly worked at, tried to improve on. Um, basically, with the Riley palette, it's a grid palette and um, I'm not gonna go into the Riley palette um, in this video, this is a very short video. Um, but if you're curious to learn more about the Riley palette, one of the uh, one of my coworkers, who's an oil painter, and uh, he teaches at the uh, Atelier Flowerfield in New York. Um, I teach remotely for them. Um, he also has a YouTube channel, and he put out a great video on the Riley palette. And uh, I will put that in the description, the link to his channel below, and you can check that out. His name is William Graff. It's uh, William Graff Watercolors is the YouTube channel. Um, but basically you can see here I'm um, noodling away and mixing my colors and the colors, the primary colors I'm starting with for this Riley palette are Alizarin Crimson, Cadmium Red, Cadmium Yellow, um, Ivory Black, Titanium White, and Burnt Umber. And those are your starting colors for the Riley palette. And then what you're doing is you're making a, uh, you're making a grid and that grid will be three uh, rows to start and then um, basically you're starting out with a gray line at the top and then you're doing your um, your yellow from uh, lightest to dark and then your pinks and reds from lightest to dark and then what you're doing is you're going down the line vertically in each column and then mixing your flesh tones going from light to dark that bottom rung will be your workhorse palette for your flesh tones and then if you need to if you need to modify that um, bottom row you can just chain in any of the colors that you have on that palette um, it's a great palette um, I, I, I honestly this is my first time actually using the Riley, Riley palette um, myself and I tried it out and I loved it I typically use the Zorn limited palette and the Zorn palette is four four colors but I modify it I throw in a cobalt blue so the Zorn palette is cobalt blue um, yellow ochre, uh, titanium white, ivory black, and then it, they used to use vermilion. I use a cadmium red in place of vermilion. It gives it a little bit more pop and a little bit more vibrancy. And yeah, no, no cadmium yellow in the Zorn palette. It's a very sort of earthy palette, but I've used it for flesh tones as well. It works pretty well. Um, but I think I do think the Riley palette gives you a little bit more range for flesh tones. It's just a bit a bit more involved with regards to color mixing. You're really you're you're making an entire grid. Um, you can see what I'm doing is I'm using a paper towel occasionally to kind of sop up some of the extra blotting that's going on. I'm not raking the paper towel across the surface, and I'm really trying to be conservative with how much I use it. Um, I teach watercolor and gouache as well, and typically what I see with a lot of students is like. They'll tend to use the paper towel as a catch-all safety blanket, and you don't want to do that. I, there is a thin film of of that faint uh, flesh tone over the our right side, his left side of his face, Legolas's face there, 
and really I'm kind of leveraging the white of the paper a little bit and letting some of that white of the paper seep through but there is a wash over his face it's very faint and, and that's going to simulate that highlight that that's that really harsh light that is shining on his face from the right side uh, or left side rather of the image sorry I'm getting my right and my left confused um, and you can see I just built it up slowly from light to dark. Typically I would do that with oils as well, though sometimes I'll start out with a warm neutral and then go dark and then go back to lights. Um, and I'm just kind of noodling away here, noodling away at his face, um, having fun with it. Uh, it's coming along. I I'm trying to be cognizant of my edges. I use a round brush, not a flat brush, always a round brush whenever you're doing the face. Um, and that allows you to control the edges a lot better and um, just knocking in some highlights on that hair now. And because I'm inventing this, you know, I have two pieces of main reference that I'm going off of, and Aragorn and Legolas basically have very good reference, and then Gimli is sort of like the oddball out where I'm gonna have to go in and invent a, a little bit more of the light source on his face. Um, but also, with regards to the background, it's it's uh, the Chamber, chamber of Mazarbul from Lord of the Rings. I'm going to have to go in and also sort of invent the direction of the light in that as well. Um, a lot of the images I do are sort of from imagination, you know, um, buttressed by reference, but basically when you get down to it, it's, it's scenes that don't exist. So I have to, and a lot of, and a lot of times I have to uh, invent the light source. Incidentally, I'll put a link to this also in the description. These pieces will be available for purchase at the Vermont Winter Renaissance Fair in um, Essex, Vermont. And I'll put a link to that in the uh, description. That's happening on the weekend of February 3rd. I'll be there with prints. I'll be there with playmats. Um, I'll be there with stickers, ornaments, all sorts of little knickknacks that you can purchase and some, and some original art as well. Um, besides these small format gouaches that I do, I do uh, large format oils. I have a few of those there available for purchase, so I'll put that in the link as well. So if you're in the local northern Vermont area, definitely want to check that out. Um, this is a fairly short video, but I wanted to just get this out there as part two. You can see sort of the progression. Part three will be coming out next week. And uh, my goal is to kind of release a video a week uh, from now on, just to crank up the frequency of my videos. Um, you know, as the channel progresses, I find that at this time of the year, too, I have more content as I have more work that I'm doing, more commissions, more shows that I'm doing. So why not just, uh, you know, show you guys exactly what I'm working on here. Um, and you can see I've mixed some grays in there. My shadows tend to have more greens in them. They're a little bit warmer. Um, I definitely like the warm shadows as opposed to the cool blue shadows. There's a place for, there's a time and a place to kind of chain blues into your shadows and your blacks. But I generally go uh, the other way. I generally go with deep dark greens for my shadows. Keep it warm. Unless something's really, tr you're trying to make something really look like it's receding, then I'll add some blues into my shadows. But even in Aragorn, Legolas too. Lots of, there's actually a fair bit of black, red in my black, brown in my black. There's, you know, using burnt umber. You can see that uh, I've laid in a wash in the foreground on that pillar in the foreground that's being cut off panel there. I'm gonna go in on top of that and like lay in a gray wash. So I'm sort of like washing a lot of the gouache and watercolor out, treating the gouache like watercolor. Uh, when I paint acrylic, I tend, to, I tend to do the same thing. I'll wash the acrylic out and do really th and paint pretty thin and then gradually I switch it switch over and start painting thick sometimes I'll ping pong back and forth between thin and thick especially with acrylic because it dries so fast um, but you know acrylic is a little bit of a different animal I find that gouache is very versatile you get a lot of control with it um, that you don't even necessarily get with watercolor and certainly not with acrylic uh, acrylic is probably the most unforgiving I know people say watercolor is the most unforgiving medium. I would have to say acrylic is probably the most unforgiving medium, in my opinion. Um, a lot of veteran artists love it. Um, me, I, I, I've kind of taken more of a shining to it in recent years. Still, at my heart, hearts though, I still prefer oil, um, just for the fact that you can keep reworking it. 
Uh, the problem with the whales, though, it takes a long time to produce a piece if you're working large format, just because of the slow giant drying time, and because of what's involved in preparing the surface. Um, surface really matters with, with painting in general, but I think even more so with oil paint, the surface really matters. Um, acrylic too. I mean, I think acrylic, that's the other thing. Acrylic, the uh, surface comes more into play with both of those things. Um, but we're getting near the end of the video here, I'm just kind of coming in. You can see I'm working on that pylon. And yeah, I mean, just trying to have fun with it. You know, I'm going to go in and touch this up. I still have to add a lot of details to Aragorn's uh, uniform. Um, and then you'll see me working. Gimli was very challenging. You'll see me kind of uh, working Gimli quite a bit in the next the next video. He came out good in the end, but it was definitely a challenge sort of putting him off till the end. I thought he would go a little easier than he did. He's got a lot of nooks and crannies in his face, which I like, but those come with their own set of considerations. You know, when you're painting someone with a lot of nooks and crannies in their face. And yeah, this was done 100% by myself. <laughs> No AI was involved in the creation of this. So I just wanted to kind of put this out there. Pillar's looking good. Adding some sort of muddy green there, which reads sort of almost like gray. Trying to build some contrast. Get the Terminator shadows. And we're chugging along. If you have any questions on this process that I didn't address, I know it was a fairly quick video, feel free to chime in down in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, right? Every subscribe and like really helps. Much appreciated. If you find any value from these time lapses. Um, please, by all means, support human-made artists. <laughs> or human artists, not human-made. I mean, human artists. <laughs> human-made art, <laughs> I should say. Can't speak today. Yeah, and we're coming down to the end of the video here. Just finalizing Legolos. But again, I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial today, and I will see you all next week. Thanks, and take care.